Okay, so yesterday we started the um, uh, control, uh, uh, the active control of the spacecraft by using some devices. And in particular, we introduced uh, we, the wheel dampers and uh, the magnetotorx. Although the magnetotorx, so we only uh, introduced them briefly. So we need to go in detail uh, to explain how those, uh, uh, those uh, work indeed. So the, the main uh, uh, thing to do here is indeed uh, to demonstrate uh, what are the advantages of uh, some uh, of the actuators, uh, of some actuators, uh, and the disadvantage and the weakness uh, of uh, the others. So we are starting from the uh, cheaper devices. That's the reason why we are starting from wheel dampers, magnetotorques, and today we are also going to see for the first time, uh, the uh, thrusters. So how to use the thrusters to indeed uh, determine the control of uh, a spacecraft. But before going to uh, that active uh, actuator, so what we need to do here uh, is to show why, for example, wheel dampers are not uh, very well suited uh, to determine, uh, the, to control uh, the spacecraft attitude. And that's the reason why are not uh, widespread uh, uses uh, uh, used uh, in uh, in the uh, space application anymore. One of the main disadvantage uh, that probably yesterday was not uh, fully clear can be shown from the example that we have in uh, MATLAB. So let me show you the example. So yesterday, I don't know if uh, some of you noticed that by assuming a moment of inertia of the wheel uh, equal to 0 0.04 kilograms per uh, square meter and uh, a damping, uh, so a viscous, uh, uh, the viscosity of the fluid that they give you a parameter D equal to 10 to minus three, those parameters uh, are, let me bring this uh, close to the MATLAB program. This parameter corresponds to this equation here. We have seen that in order to control, for example, the pitch axis with the wheel dampers, we need to include an additional equation to the uh, dynamical equation of the pitch axis. So we don't only totally have theta dot dot i y plus the gravity gradient plus equal to the disturbance. What we have this term that is given indeed by the um, trend or the uh, evolution of the angular speed of the wheel given by a certain viscosity of the fluid because the wheel is indeed into um, a sort of box with uh, uh, viscous uh, fluid that create uh, a damping effect. The reason why, for example, this device is not really uh, fully adequate is that, uh, that by assuming the spacecraft that we have seen last time, so with uh, a, a boom along the z-axis, we were able to increase the moment of inertia of ix and iy to ad and ad2. And we also have seen why we need to choose uh, this relation between the two in order to maintain stability because of the gravity gradient. Well, if we use that uh, and the disturbance uh, along the pitch axis, uh, we have seen uh, that, uh, of course, uh, the roll and pitch axis uh, will not be affected. So the uh, x-axis is in hours. So you can see that uh, with that uh, kind of uh, uh, wheel damper, the, uh, you can notice that, uh, I mean, the value that I use are the physical values of a realistic wheel damper. But you can see that even with a small uh, uh, disturbance of 10 to the minus five Newton per meter along the pitch axis, you are not able to dump this effect uh, after 150, 140 hours. So you have many, many orbits in which this disturbance is not dumped. So one, uh, in principle, 
could say. So one of the, the first weakness of this device is that you need a very long time in order to dump those effects. So it is a very slow effect. Furthermore, you are not able to increase, for example, only the viscosity of the wheel, of the, of the fluid. Because if you increase, uh, for example, the, the viscosity of the fluid, for example, let's say to five, and we keep, uh, uh, let, let's keep the, the figure here. So now in black will be uh, the same case, but using a larger D. So let's put in black, for example. Okay, you are not able to see that because it is uh, on top of that, uh, but you can easily understand that uh, this, uh, uh, the dumping effect is, okay, actually here you can see that. You can see that the dumping is not really increasing, but actually you have a lower effect. That could be indeed misleading. Why if you include a, a larger dumping, a larger D, you are going to have a larger, uh, a slower dissipation. Well, the reason why is because if you look at this equation here, you can see that D is not going to change only the dynamic equation of, uh, of the pitch axis. But you can see from here that D is also affecting the, um, basically if you write as uh, omega will, dot equal to d divided by i w times theta dot minus omega well well you can see that this uh, d divided by the moment of inertia of the well is uh, the uh, basically as uh, the effect of the uh, the, the spring um, when you have, for example, uh, so it is an effect, actually, that it, it is the dumping effect directly on, uh, on the wheel itself. So by varying D in the dynamical equations of the pitch, you're also changing uh, the evolution of the angular velocity of the wheel. So the two equations are coupled. And so what happened here is that the evolution of the wheel, uh, so it's not really effective. Uh, so basically the um, coefficients of the wheel dump, so of the, of the viscous uh, fluid, is not the only parameter that you need to change in order to, for example, uh, increase the dumping effect on the wheel. Because if you increase D, you are increasing also how the, um, you are also changing the uh, equation that is directly related to the, uh, to the wheel itself. So one thing that you can do indeed, in order to reduce the dumping effect, so to, to reduce the, the dumping, uh, to the um, the oscillations uh, is to keep uh, one ten to minus thirteen and increase uh, the moment of inertia of the wheel. That uh, you can see that will uh, provide a definitely uh, larger dumping. And after one hundred uh, one hundred hours, uh, basically you are able to converge closer to your uh, uh, your desired angle. So the main uh, problem here that is not, it will not be the case for, uh, will not be the case for the reaction wheels, is that the viscosity term that you have uh, for the wheel is not only affecting the pitch 
uh, dynamics, but also uh, affecting the evolution of the spin rate of the wheel. And that's the reason why you are not able to change that independently from the moment of inertia of the wheel. So in principle, what you need to do is to increase D and increase also the moment of inertia in order to have a larger damping effect uh, without affecting too much the equation of the wheel. But uh, the problem is that, uh, as we have seen before, you are not able to change the moment of inertia of the wheel with uh, unreasonable values. For example, uh, the large value that was in literature is indeed one kilogram per cubic per square meter because you are not able to have a huge wheel. And that's the reason why basically you're not able to uh, provide a good, uh, um, good dumping effect. So what you need to do, for example, is to try to change the, the coefficients accordingly to the moment of inertia and see which is the response of the wheel and the pitch dynamics that optimize your, um, your task. So for example, one possible um, best solution could be indeed by increasing, uh, so by having uh, the moment of inertia one and uh, the um, uh, D coefficients equal to one. And that will give you indeed uh, the, uh, a good trend for the dumping effect of the spacecraft dynamics. So that's the main problem with the, uh, wheel, um, the wheel dumpers so are very slow and also you have that the dynamics of the wheel is coupled with the dynamics of the pitch and the, the parameters that are, uh, govern the um, uh, evolution of, uh, of the pitch dynamics are not independent from the uh, wheel dynamics itself. So the other possible solution that we started to see yesterday is indeed using another uh, cheaper uh, actuator. And the cheaper actuator is the magneto torque. So the magneto torque or torque road is based on the principle that if you have a coil in which you have an electric current that is creating an a magnetic dipole, a magnetic moment, M, in which we know, for example, for, for, example, for a, a circle a coil that the uh, moment, uh, magnetic moment is equal to the current that you are using times the uh, surface. Sorry, I tried to write, I, probably it's better if I relax to write uh, with the, the mouse because this is not working properly. Uh, so what I wrote here is that the magnetic moment is equal to the current that is passing through the coil times the surface, okay? So basically what you have here is that if you have a certain axis of the coil, you have a current that is passing through this area S and these create a magnetic dipole that uh, it is important because basically the, uh, we know that uh, the interaction between the magnetic uh, field and the magnetic dipole uh, generates a torque that tends to align the magnetic dipole to the, uh, to the magnetic field. So the interaction, the interaction between the magnetic moment of the coil and the known magnetic field of the earth is responsible for irresponsible for um, a tau that is given by the cross product of the magnetic dipole of the coil times the magnetic field of the earth. Okay, and this is the expression that we have written here. The difference between the one that I wrote here and the one that you have here 
is that here I'm considering a single uh, magnetic dipole. But in principle, uh, as I wrote yesterday, I drew yesterday, um, what you have here is that for the, if this is the body reference frame, you have uh, three coils. I mean, I'm uh, simplified, uh, uh, simplifying the, uh, the problem because uh, usually you have solenoids or other kind of uh, uh, devices, uh, as we're going to see later, that generate a current. And so you have the possibility to have uh, three magnetic mo uh, dipe, uh, moments in the three directions of uh, the body frame. The problem is, as I said, that if this is the magnetic field of, uh, so if this is the body frame of the spacecraft, you need to include additional sensors in order to determine the direction of the, uh, the direction of the magnetic field. So I can see my, uh, let's see. Okay, let me do with this one, it's better. So you need to determine the direction of the magnetic field of the earth. And so you need uh, to know, you need to have additional sensor in the body frame that give you the measurements of uh, uh, a precise measurement of the magnetic field of the planet. So you need uh, three additional sensors that give you indeed the components of the uh, magnetic field of the planet. So you are able to change the magnetic moments of the coils by changing the current I, okay? And you need to know what, what is the orientation of the magnetic field with magnet, ma magnetometers that need to provide an accurate measurement of the magnetic field with respect to the body frame. However, the problem, the main problem with magnetotorques is that you are not able to provide a control torque, a total control torque in the three, uh, in the three dimension, uh, unique, uh, so, so a, a full control in the three direction. Because if you explicit that the cross product of the magnetic moments and the magnetic field in the matricial form, you can easily see that the skew antisymmetry matrix for the cross product is not invertible, is not singular. So you're not able to provide a certain uh, current to the magnetic coils in order to have uh, a desired control. Okay, so what we can do then? What we, uh, we're going to see two different approaches. So the first approach, is uh, to use uh, um, is to uh, try to determine the control of, for example, the um, the yo axis. As we have seen, the uh, yo axis, uh, because of um, of the gravity gradient, is not. Uh, it represents the main problem in the uh, attitude control because the uh, gravity gradient do not provide does not provide uh, enough uh, um, passive control on that axis. So we can try to use the magnetometers in order to stabilize that specific axis. Okay, so if our goal is to determine the control torque in the yo axis. What we can see here, or uh, we know, for example, we know also that the uh, U axis is not decoupled from the P, uh, from the roll axis. So we know we we need also to use uh, 
uh, the uh, the torque, the control torque along the uh, axis uh, of the of the roll axis. So basically, we are trying to solve uh, uh, to use the magneto torque torque rods to uh, stabilize the roll and the uh, dynamics because we are we are assuming that the pitch axis is already stabilized through the gravity gradient. If we do so, we can basically assume uh, that the, our, uh, our only goal is uh, uh, to determine the uh, control torques by using the uh, magnetic field in direction of the pitch axis. So what it means uh, that we're going to use the uh, coils along the roll axis to control the yo axis and the coil along the yo axis to control the roll axis. I know that could be misleading, but the reason why you are controlling the opposite axis is because of the cross product properties of the magneto torque rods. So we can see that if we assume uh, that the control along the roll axis is only given by um, M theta, because we are assuming here that we don't want to control the, uh, uh, the pitch axis. So we are assuming that the MY is equal to zero. So we are only using the magnet, ma magnetic coils uh, along the roll and uh, the yo axis. You can see directly that uh, these two uh, torques uh, only relies on uh, the component of the magnetic field along the uh, pitch axis. So basically it's the projection of this uh, vector here along the pitch axis. So we have found explicitly the amount of current because we know that the magnetic dipole and magnetic moment is directly related to the current if we know the area of the coil to uh, generate a certain torque in the roll axis and in the pitch axis, in the yo axis. Okay, so now the problem here is that the magnetic field of the Earth is not, I mean, uh, as the, the shape that you already seen in other courses, especially in space environment, I guess, in which you know that since you have the dipole of the magnetic field of the Earth, you have that the line of the magnetic fields are close to be uh, close to the z direction along the equator, but tends to close very uh, when you approach the polar regions. So it means that if we assume uh, So if we assume uh, uh, a polar orbit, uh, so for example, let's uh, include a shape here. So a polar circular orbit. Uh, what you have, uh, is that, and we also define the reference frame of the spacecraft. So let's write, for example, you know that this is the um, roll axis. And uh, this is the U axis. So let me put in blue, probably it is easier to be see all yellow. Okay, so what you can see here, for example, that when you are very close to the equator, 
the magnetic field of the Earth will be very close to the Bx direction. So the pitch axis here is orthogonal to the plane of the orbit, and we don't have any magnetic field along this axis, okay? So probably in that particular region, we are not able to use uh, uh, the magneto torques uh, or the magneto torques to determine the gravity field. On top of that, if you have a larger uh, an altitude of the spacecraft that is larger, so you have an increasing altitude of the spacecraft, or you have an eccentric orbit or a, polar, a circular orbit with a larger uh, radius, the magnitude of the magnetic field significantly reduces because it reduces with the cubic of the distance. So the magneto torques have these two weaknesses. The first weakness is that the orientation of the magnetic field changes during the, uh, the direction of the magnetic field changes along the orbit. And uh, furthermore, it will be lower at higher altitudes. So if you have lower magnetic field, you, ne you need to use uh, larger current and uh, it is uh, possible that you don't have enough power to provide the torque that you need. So those are the main caveats. And uh, for example, in the case that we are seeing here, so trying to control the role and uh, so the, uh, yes, the role and the axis, we need a component of the magnetic field along the pitch axis. So for example, in our case, what we are going to assume is that we don't have a polar orbit, but we have an orbit that is inclined, or at least it has an inclination with respect to the magnetic field, because we know that the magnetic field is inclined with respect to the pole of the Earth, in order to have a direction of, uh, of the magnetic field uh, in, the, uh, in the pitch axis. So basically we need a component of the magnetic field in the pitch axis in order to control the roll and the axis, okay? Furthermore, for example, uh, what you're going to see is that uh, during, along the orbit, uh, Although our main goal is to determine the torque along the roll and the axis, since we are using the uh, magnetic coils along the roll and the axis, you can see that the torque along the pitch axis, although we don't, we don't need to, uh, we don't need this uh, torque, um, it is, uh, uh, so we have a, lot, a leftover torque given by the fact that we have this moment, uh, magnetic moment uh, of these two spires. So by multiplying uh, these mx and mz with the bz and bx, we are going to have a term in the pitch axis that will represent an additional perturbation. So we are trying to use the magnetic coils to determine a control torque along the z and the x direction in order to control the roll and the axis. But we have an undesired torque on the pitch axis because the magnetic moment when it interacts with magnetic field creates this additional torque. So you can see from uh, by substituting this expression to the magnetic moment that we have seen before, you can find an expression of the magnetic uh, of the torque along the pitch axis that depends on the torque needed for the yo and pitch axis. And you can see that uh, this effect depends on uh, the ratio between the component of the magnetic field along the your axis with respect to the pitch axis, and the same for the roll axis. I'm going to show you an example of that. So let's assume that we have an orbit with a certain inclination with the magnetic lines of the, of the magnetic field, of the Earth magnetic field. So we're going to have that the angle 
so the uh, magnetic field of the earth will be will have uh, uh, so the let's let me try to uh, uh so basically let's assume that we have uh, the orbit here okay but as i said it's not a polar orbit but you have a certain you have a certain inclined inclined orbit so what i mean here is that uh, you will have uh, that uh, by looking at the uh, pitch and uh, Your axis, you will have. Uh, um, so you are basically the, uh, the you are looking at the spacecraft in the opposite side with respect of its velocity. What you are going to see is, uh, for example, that B may have a certain angle uh of 60 degrees uh, with respect to the uh so let me write also x so what you can see here is that uh, you will have uh, for example that b will have uh, an angle with respect to the uh, your axis this is uh, the total uh, norm of b0 so the projection of uh, uh, B0 in the pitch direction could be, for example, I'm trying to for, do an example that could be reasonable, B0 times the uh, cosine of uh, this angle that could be, for example, uh, uh, 60, uh, 60 degrees, okay? So the... Um, but we know also that the component along the B, the, the U axis is very small because the B direction is over here and the uh, U axis is this one. So you can see that uh, this angle is almost 90 degrees. So for example, could be uh, the, the cosine of 90 degrees minus a certain delta that could be, for example, four or five degrees, so, or three, three degrees. But anyway, if you have this component here, this means that you are going to have an additional perturbation in the, uh, you will have an additional perturbation in the pitch direction that is on the side. So let's do an example now. So I prepared uh, a MATLAB program that could be uh, easier to be uh, understood. So the goal here is to use the same spacecraft that we have seen before, with the only difference that uh, you're going to have the moment of inertia of six, eight, and uh, uh, oh, actually, let's do the, the other one. So the with the the boom along the um, along the pitch uh, along the U axis. So you have to assume that we have the same altitude, but the uh, orbit of the spacecraft is uh, uh, slightly inclined in order to have uh, that the line of the magnetic field will not be always orthogonal to the pitch direction, okay? So, for example, you can use a polar orbit because the inclination of, uh, so you have a certain inclination between the magnetic field and the pole and the, pole and the earth poles. But for example, you can assume a, an inclination of the, of, of the spacecraft orbit of about 60 degrees, for example. You can, you can assume a few uh, cases in order to see what is the effect, um, what is the inclination of the magnetic field with respect to the reference frame of the spacecraft, uh, of the spacecraft orbit. 
So the goal here is to use the, uh, to have a perturbation along the yo axis equal to 10 to the minus five uh, Newton per meter. And we know that the uh, magnetic field of, uh, of the earth is uh, in Tesla equal to 8.1 uh, 10, uh, 10 to 25 uh, times uh, 10, to, uh, uh, 10 to the minus four. And you have to divide that by the uh, radius of the, of the earth plus uh, uh, the, the altitude of the spacecraft. The reason why it is multiplied by 100 is so you have uh, that distance in centimeters because uh, this is indeed the Tesla uh, per, uh, per cubic centimeters. So in order to have B0 equal to Tesla, you have to multiply this. You can find these values in literature. But so this is our reference. And I also did uh, the same uh, dynamical equation that we have seen before. With the only difference that now our goal is to, so here I briefly introduce the uh, proportional derivative control that we're going to see later. But what you have to consider here is that our magneto torque is going to provide a torque along the theta direction that is going to be uh, basically to counterreact to the disturbance that is equal to 10 to the minus five Newton per meter. What happened here is that since our goal here is only to determine the attitude control in the roll axis direction, is that, as we have seen from the slides here, if we have that, we are trying to determine this control torque, uh, T, C, uh, Z. And we have also that the magnetic field has an inclination with respect to the U-axis as for example, uh, 88 or 87 degrees. You can see that the magneto torques are going to generate uh, a control, uh, Actually, there is a minus here. Yes. Are going to generate uh, are going to generate uh, a torque along the pitch axis that is undesired because our goal was to keep the uh, pitch axis stabilized through the gravity gradient. So what happened now? What is going to happen, uh, you probably can easily understand, uh, is that if you look at the roll axis, uh, of course, uh, there is an effect uh, because basically the magneto torque is going to stabilize uh, our... Mm -hmm. There is a question. So the psi, uh, the psi direction here is stabilized by the magneto torque, torque road after a certain time using the PD control that uh, I briefly showed in, in, the, in the MATLAB script, but we, it will be ex extensively explained uh, tomorrow. So assuming that indeed um, the magneto torque is able to counterreact the uh, disturbance, the problem that is uh, happening here is that uh, the pitch angle is going to uh, face a perturbation that is given uh, by the uh, magnetic field, uh, so the interaction of the magnetic coil along the uh, z direction and the magnetic field, sorry, the magnetic coil along the uh, um, the x direction to the magnetic field along the z direction. So what happened here is that the interaction between the magnetic coils and the magnetic field uh, is indeed creating this disturbance. That however is still mitigated by 
the gravity gradient. So the problem here, as we have seen from this plot, is that our uh, magnetic torque road is going to affect also the other dynamics. So we have to be careful that the magnetic field that we are going to generate is not going to uh, perdue, perturb the significantly the other dynamics. The final plot that I showed you here is the uh, evolution of the uh, magnetic dipole. The magnetic dipole here is this Mx. Mx is the one that is needed to generate Tcx, so Tc zeta. So the control torque divided by the magnetic moment, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth along the pitch axis, give you the, uh, this unpurpose square meter that has to be reasonable. So it means that in order to determine this moment of inertia, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, magnetic moment, you need, uh, so let, let me write uh, here. So since we said that the magnetic, uh, distur the, the disturbance along the yo axis is 10 to minus 5 Newton per meter, and we have seen that by is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field at that altitude times the cosine of 60 degrees, because for geometry uh, properties of the orbit, we can directly determine the magnetic moment. Why it is important? Because as I said, the magnetic moment will be equal to the current times the area. Since the area is fixed, the important thing is the current. So you have important constraint on the maximum current that you are able to provide to the magnetic coil. In order to mitigate this perturbation 10 to the minus five, what you can see here is, the, is that you need uh, a number per square meter uh, magnetic moment equal to 0.5. So it's not really a tremendous uh, error, uh, magnetic moment, because for example, this magnetometer, that is an example that you can find in literature, has uh, as a maximum possibility of magnetic moment close to 35 or 40 ampere per square meter. So this means that you are able to provide a magnetic moment through this magnetic coil uh, that satisfy, uh, so that basically mitigate uh, the perturbation that you are trying to counteract. The problem, as I said, is that if you are increasing the magnetic moment along the x direction, you're going to increase also the torque along the pitch axis. So you're going to increase the perturbation along the other axis. So let's have a break here for questions. And uh, let, we are going to conclude that part and start the, um, uh, the thrusters. So let's uh, conclude the magneto torque roads. So the torque roads that we have seen so far has the main advantage to use uh, the property, one property of the, of the earth, uh, of earth, so the magnetic field, one physical property to determine a torque by using a cheap device as a magnetic coil, magnetic torque roads. The problem here is that when we try to stabilize the, uh, for example, the O-axis, uh, we have seen that those magnetic coils provide uh, an underside effect on, uh, for example, the pitch axis. So we have to be careful that everything will be indeed in, uh, will not affect uh, the other component. So uh, the final thing that I would like to point out here is that uh, there is also an, an an alternative uh, procedure to determine the 
uh, torque given by the magnetic coils. So previously, what we have done here, we said we need to determine T, uh, Tc in the roll and the O-axis, and we determined the magnetic coil, uh, the magnetic moment to determine that uh, torques. The final formula you find here is more general. So what you can find here is that if you take the uh, original formulation that the control is equal to the magnetic moments uh, uh, cross product of B, and you multiply with the cross product by both sides, you can explicit uh, this uh, form here by using the properties of the scalar and uh, of scalar and dot product, uh, the, the dot and the cross product. And you know that this uh, product can be written as B dot product of B M minus B dot product of M times B. By assuming that B is orthogonal to M, that as I said, is not always the case. We are assuming that this one is equal to zero. And that one give you that M can be directly computed if it is orthogonal to the magnetic field by this expression. So this is the torque that we want to apply to the spacecraft. The magnetic field is known from the magnetic sensor, the magnetometers, and we can determine the magnetic, field, the magnetic moments. This expression is not solving the problem of the inversion that we have seen here. You're going to have exactly the same problem that you had before, because you are not able to provide any torque parallel So parallel to the magnetic is not uh, to the magnetic field. So you are not able. So this is not possible. Okay, you are not able to provide any torque parallel to the magnetic field. But this is a simple form to determine the magnetic moment that uh, give you the best. Uh, magnetic moment distribution to generate this control here. You have to be careful, as I said, that you're not able to provide any torque along the magnetic axis, the magnetic direction. Okay, so the, uh, this is an example of the magnetic torque rose. So as I said, we emphasize the weakness of these instruments. The main advantage is the fact that the magnetic field for an Earth satellite is always there, especially if you are at low orbits. And also it is very, um, with a very low mass and low volume. And this is another important uh, characteristic. And on the left, right side, you can find the electrical property that are fundamental when you want to see, for example, that you have a disturbance and you can try to counteract the disturbance by varying the electrical properties, for example, the current of the coil. And this is an important thing because you have a maximum current that you have to apply. So if the disturbance requires a maximum current, a current that is larger than this maximum current, this means that the magnetic torques are not able to counteract the disturbance itself. Here, for example, it is proposed an exercise for a LEO satellite. You can try. Uh, it is an interesting exercise, of course, also to have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. Uh, here I reported uh, only a couple of uh, plots that are based on the uh, exercise that I show you in MATLAB. The only difference, as I said in the previous lecture, is in this book, uh, the same exercise is done by using the uh, uh, by using the entire the full uh, expression of the dynamical equations uh, of the dynamical equations. So as you can see here, 
uh, the uh, behavior that we have uh, by using uh, the uh, by using the MATLAB program. So I try to reproduce what is done in the exercise. Uh, I tried because there are not all uh, the information that we need. Uh, for example, the direction of the magnetic field. So I try to mimic uh, what you have here. But what I would like to emphasize is that so the plot that you have here is after the transition phase of the magnetometer. So basically it starts from here in this case. And it is converging to indeed the two ten to the minus one. So by using the magnetometer in uh, magnet, uh, sorry, the torque road in the x direction, you're able to provide this uh, control of the u axis. However, the main difference that you can notice from my plot and the one that you have on your left side is that the roll and the pitch dynamics are completely different because, uh, as I said. This perturbation, uh, this perturbation that you have here, so this uh, torque uh, that is uh, given by the m zeta, uh, sorry, mx, uh, uh, so the magnetic uh, moment uh, along the x-axis, is going to provide uh, a disturbance on the pitch axis. And res with respect to the example that I showed you the previous hour, here you can see that the amplitude is larger because I changed the moment of inertia. So by using the moment of inertia without the boom, you have a larger effect on the pitch axis. And basically we are losing the uh, property, we are losing the uh, constraint uh, on the small axis approximation. And that's the reason why these plots are not fully accurate because you need to integrate the full dynamical equations, the full LR equations. And that's the reason why here you have these, um, these uh, differences. On the right, right side here is the same case in which you don't have any magnetic torque load. The one that we have seen for the gravity, uh, gravity gradient stabilization. So that case, is solved by introducing a magneto torque road on the x direction that counteract the uh, torque along the u axis. As I said, the uh, pitch uh, dynamics is still poorly controlled. The last plot here is the same on your left side. The right side give you the variation of the torque in, along the uh, x and the z direction. So be careful that to have this one, you need to compare to this one. So what I mean is that this is the psi angle and this is the torque along the, so this one should be tied to this one. And indeed uh, converge to 10 to the minus five uh, Newton per meter. But you see also that there is this uh, torque that is acting on the pitch axis uh, given by the fact that here mx is not equal to zero to generate a t uh, control zeta equal to m zeta times by. Okay. That's, so that's our goal that create, however, a disturbance in the pitch direction. Okay, so what is uh, the problem with this kind of control system? Is that we are not able to provide a 3D stabilization, a 3D control of the spacecraft. So we need to dedicate the last couple of lectures on the control, uh, uh, control, uh, on the control theory, control estimation. 
so the control det uh, the determination of a control system that enables the uh, to reach uh, that allow us to reach a desired attitude of the spacecraft so the first scheme that we are going to see is for uh, especially for thrusters and uh, our diff diff uh, so this uh, scheme can be called on off or bank bang it is a simpler scheme with respect to what we are going to see tomorrow that is uh, more uh, that is actually the scheme used for uh, reaction wheels for example because here uh, the off uh, on off and bang bang control are indeed well suited to device that works impulsively so for example thrusters that provide an impulsive torque in order to uh, move and reorient the spacecraft the first scheme that we're going to see it is called on off control so this is the first time that we're going to show the a closer loop control system so we have uh, a desired orientation of the spacecraft that we want to reach. This desired orientation has to be compared with the known uh, orientation of the spacecraft given by our sensors. So this is given by the sensors of the spacecraft. So basically, as we have seen, the sensors give us the measurement that we need, for example, V, W, and omega if we have gyroscopes. We have the Quest algorithm, and the Quest algorithm, for example, give you the quaternion at that time. So one thing that we have to point it out here, that we are assuming small angles also for control theory so we are assuming the thing that we have said before so that the variations along the row p h and u axis are assumed to be equal to two uh, delta q one delta q two delta q three so the vector part of the quaternion okay why we need to do that because i mean one of the main problems that you can face too is you don't you are not able to provide a desired attitude of the spacecraft by using quaternion so the main thing to do is to go back to our role pitch and your axis representation in order to compare the Theta, the theta measured, so this will be the theta measured with our theta desired. And we do the difference, and this difference gives us the error. So the difference between our desired orientation and the measured orientation from the sensor. So now probably you are starting to have a comprehensive view of how the control scheme, the attitude and control system of a spacecraft work. Okay, uh, so let's start with the on-off bang bang because of course uh, this is uh, the simpler um, approach. So it means uh, that uh, if our error, so the difference between our theta desired minus theta measured is larger than zero well you have to provide a torque called u so this is our torque so start so basically fire your thrusters in order to have a torque that enables to follow the attitude of the spacecraft and you are able to update that because our u dt, so basically our uh, torque is going to, through the dynamical equation, change the attitude of the spacecraft. Our sensors are going to remeasure the attitude and we can recompare the uh, orientation measured with the desired orientation. 
what is the main problem with this uh, with this uh, uh, approach? Assuming th this is uh, the spacecraft. And you have the thrusters here and here. So you have a perturbation that is constant T along the Y axis. So the orthogonal axis here is Y. And so we have, so when the spacecraft is started to rotate, so we're going to have that our, so our t theta desired is equal to zero, but because of the perturbation, the spacecraft it starts to rotate with a certain theta measured, okay? So this is theta measured, sorry, it is not readable. Let me rewrite that. If it works, but it doesn't work. Okay, then let me try. So this is our theta measured. So when uh, this one is going to be greater than zero, because uh, we are assuming that theta desired is equal to zero, is the angle along the pitch axis. So we are considering a single, uh, uh, so a one dimension problem. The so the thrusters, so when our sensor is going to measure this angle, started to fire. And so if, uh, the uh, disturbance is constantly going to this direction, the thrusters can use this on-off procedure to follow the disturbance, to basically counteract the disturbance, okay? What is the problem here? Is that if you have an error in the opposite direction, direction you are not able to, uh, to correct that because we are assuming, for example, that the thrusters are only going to provide this kind of torque that counteracts. And furthermore, if the thrusters are going to fire, that indeed can counteract a, a, a torque. But if we want to use the, these, uh, uh, if we have only a, a rotation of the, the spacecraft from one angle to the other one, and we want to bring back the spacecraft to the initial angle, you can see here is that, uh, that we can bring the spacecraft towards uh, the angle, but we are not able to stop it. Because basically the spacecraft, because of the thrusting, so of the, manu of the, of the firing of the thrusters is going to rotate with a certain angular velocity. That's the reason why the second scheme that is more precise is called the bang bang. So bang bang has the same uh, example. Prego, prego. Vuoi ripetere un attimo il problema del, del on off, per favore? Sì, sì, certo. So the, the problem with the on off, I know that probably could be uh, not fully, so it is not really, uh, uh, very often used because of this problem. So the main problem that I'm trying to explain is that if you have a torque that is acting on the spacecraft, the torque is going to provide an angular, an acceleration of the angular velocity of the spacecraft. So uh, you are, the spacecraft is going to rotate along this axis. When the, um, so if uh, this uh, torque is constant, the angle here is going to increase. And so the error between our theta measured and theta decided that this is zero because we, are, we want a zero angle is going to increase. So when uh, this is going to increase, we can see that when the error is positive, the, the thrusters are going to uh, 
uh, fire and so provide the maximum torque available from the thrusters. Okay, so actually, I, I, I so the, this is, uh, so the, in order to balance these torque rows, uh, the thruster should be this one and this one, of course. So in order to have a torque from the thrusters that are going to counteract the disturbance in the y direction. So don't look at these, uh, uh, let me see if I can delete it, but I don't think so. Okay, yes. So what I mean here is that you have a torque that is acting in this direction. And so you have a positive measure the theta. But you have also, uh, so when uh, the error is going to be larger than zero, the thrusters are going to fire. And you can uh, use the maximum torque from uh, the uh, thrusters. So this is the torque of the thrusters. This is going to uh, balance the, the uh, perturbation that is uh, acting on the spacecraft. The main problem of the thrusters here is that if the torque, the disturbance torque stops, and so we are going only to have a misalignment of our desired attitude of the spacecraft with respect to the one that is measured, we're going to see an error that is positive. But, in order to bring the spacecraft back to the original position, we are not able to stop it because what happened here, so the second case, is that, uh, so the second case is the opposite. So basically you have your spacecraft that is inclined with a certain angle and you want to bring the spacecraft to this orientation that, your, that is your theta desired, okay? Since you don't have a disturbance anymore, when you fire the thrusters here, you're going to generate a torque in this direction. When the spacecraft is going to be close uh, to the desired attitude, it's not able to stop. So you are not able to use on-off uh, uh, procedure to uh, provide accurate uh, attitude control. You can use on-off only to, uh, for example, counteract specific perturbation. So what it means that, as it is written in the slides, it, lo it works as a thermostat heater. So when your house is reaching a lower temperature, your thermostat increases the temperature, okay? But you are not able to uh, do, for example, the opposite if it is only a heater and not uh, an air conditioning system, for example. So you're able to do a boost in a certain direction, but you're not able to have the opposite direction. And so the problem here is that you can counter-react torque, torque, torques, but you're not able to provide the precise pointing of the spacecraft. Okay? Okay, grazie. So the other technique is to use the same approach, but having, for example, pro thrusters. So this is always the pitch dynamics, okay? You have a four thrusters here. And you can indeed generate torques in this direction and in this direction. So you have the sign of your errors. When the error is positive, you are going to generate, so it means, for example, that your perturbation is this one. You're going to have this tau from the thrusters, that is the torque given by the thruster. When the perturbation is negative, you're going to have 
minus Umax. So let's call the Umax probably. I don't like uh, the terminology U. So tau is a torque. That's the reason why I prefer a tau. But in order to be consistent to the scheme, let's uh, call it Umax. Okay. And so this is the first uh, uh, control scheme that we are seeing, and tomorrow we are going to conclude that. That give you the uh, control of the spacecraft by trusting the, so by firing the thrusters in order to determine to reach a certain pointing. So not only to counteract the disturbance, but also to provide a decided uh, measurement, a decided pointing of the spacecraft. Be careful that E1 and E2 are not equal to zero, but there is a dead zone. So there is a small angle, let's say a small angle delta theta here, that cannot be uh, reached by the thrusters. So it means that you have a, an error lower than that one. Your thrusters are not able to reach uh, uh, an accuracy of the attitude lower than this uh, error here. So that's the reason why there is, uh, um, there is uh, uh, this uh, additional E1 and E2. But it's only for uh, the realistic design of the thruster. You can assume for simplicity that E1 and E2 are equal to zero. But you have to be careful that in reality there is a dead zone. And so you have to be careful that there, uh, you have to consider these additional terms. Okay, so today we're going to see the simplified example of the bang-bang approach. The simplified example is assuming that the thrusters are going to uh, act with the delta function. So you have a impulsive maneuvers. Okay, so you know, you are assuming that the thruster is working with uh, um, a zero delta time. So it is really instantaneous, okay? So it means that in order to provide a torque M, the, uh, the thrusters do not uh, need any time. So for example, time zero, the uh, thruster is going to generate torque M, that is instantaneous, and the time TF are going to generate an opposite torque. The reason why you need to do that is for the problem that I said before. So, for example, you have your spacecraft that is pointing towards another direction. And you want to bring your spacecraft to this reference frame here. As I said, this one is your theta, theta measured. So what you're going to do, you're going to provide a Umax instantaneously in order to start the rotation of the spacecraft along this direction. But when it's going to approach your theta final, exactly when, for example, theta measured is equal to your theta desired, that we are assuming is equal to zero. So when theta desired is equal to theta measured, you're going to refire again. So the first one will be, so if we have four thrusters like this one, the first Umax is given by trusting from this thruster here and this thruster here. When uh, the spacecraft is reaching this state here, you refire with the other two in order to maintain that the theta desired is equal to theta measured. So you are going to have a minus Umax, or in this case will be called M, to keep the spacecraft at that pointing error, uh, at that pointing angle. So here we are not considering uh, the pitch axis, but we are using the psi uh, angle 
so the yaw axis because as we have seen it is the uh, axis that is uh, poorly controlled by gravity gradient so we can assume that this is uh, the gravity gradient is small and we can try to use our thrusters in order to control the terms of the psi angle so the dynamical equation will be, will re, will be really simple because we are uh, neglecting the gravity gradient that is assumed to be zero, basically. So we have only that i z times psi dot dot is equal to the torque that is applied by the, uh, by the thrusters in order to reach, so our goal is to reach psi final at time t final. So if we do so, the uh, thrusters can be modeled, the torque given by the thruster is given by m0 times the first delta, delta t, So is uh, the uh, delta, the uh, Dirac's, uh, Dirac's delta that is uh, induced at the initial epoch t equal to zero. And we have a second delta negative at time t final. So it will be t minus t final. The reason why it is called the M zero is because uh, the delta, Dirac's delta, has uh, the, uni uh, the unit of uh, the delta, uh, the Dirac's delta is uh, one over second. Okay, so it means uh, that M0 is not equal to Newton per meter, but will be Newton per meter per second, for example. So the uh, units of M0. Because delta, So it will be one over second. So what we need to do is to integrate this dynamical equation. And uh, this will be really straightforward for uh, the uh, Dirac delta. Because if we do the uh, uh, integration over time, we will need only two periods. The periods between the two trusting, so zero at the final, and after t final. Indeed, if we do the integral of psi dot dot, we, are get, we get omega z. Omega z will be equal to m0 divided by i z, so the moment of inertia along the u-axis. And this is the integral between the zero and the, the generic time t of the two delta of uh, Dirac's delta. Okay, so we can divide this integral here. So the first part, uh, so let me write here. So the first part will be indeed C dot time will be equal to M zero divided by the moment of inertia the integral from zero to t of delta t prime minus delta t prime minus t final times delta t prime. If we do this uh, integral between uh, t zero and t final, the two Dirac's delta so the first one will be equal to zero because we are in this part here. So the second delta, Dirac's delta didn't happen. Okay, so we are the only Dirac's delta that occurred in that time frame. So between zero and T final is indeed the first Dirac's delta. It is positive and it is equal to one. Okay, so the integral of this one will be equal to one.
the second time the second part will be the integral from the um, m0 id uh, sorry so this will be c dot uh, time Okay, times the integral of these delta Dirac's, but, oh, sorry, between, uh, so T final and T. If you do this integral, you can uh, find indeed, so you have to do the integral of the two delta in delta uh, T prime you can find indeed that this integral will be equal to zero. So it means that the angular velocity of the spacecraft will be equal to omega z uh, equal to m zero divided by i zeta. And after t final will be equal to zero because uh, the second delta Dirac occurred and so cancel the, the angular velocity induced by the first uh, thrusting of the manu of the wheels. So tomorrow we're going to see how the angles of the spacecraft evolves over time. Uh, and we are going to see that this only represents uh, a simplified example because in reality, the thrusters works with a finite time tau. And uh, that will represent indeed the main weakness of thrusters. Although the other main weakness is indeed that we have to consume propellant and also can provide the structure problems, uh, structure perturbations. So tomorrow we're going to see that in detail. And we're going also to start the control theory uh, for, uh, that is important for the reaction wheels. Okay, so let's stop here.